Welcome back to Slave Nation, and thank you for tuning in. I am now here with Jillian. I keep wanting to call you Julian for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And your last name is Keenan? That's right. Okay, because I, I mess up names like nobody's business. <laughs> now, I gave them all the information before we started about your website, your Twitter, um, FET, but we can give them all, that all again, and we can give it again at the end if you like. Yeah, great. I appreciate that. So you want to tell them a little about your sites? Uh, yeah, um, I'll introduce myself, I guess. Um, my name's Jillian, and I'm a spanking fetishist and journalist and author uh, of a book about spanking called Sex with Shakespeare. Um, I'm online at www.jillianNYC.com, um, and I'm on Twitter at Jillian Keenan. My FET name is also Jillian Keenan, so if anyone wants to connect on social media, uh, I would love to hear from them. Wonderful. Okay, so the, I had, do have lots of questions. Now... Yeah, I'm excited to chat. I know. Okay, so now when I read you, it describes you as ultra-sexual. Would you like to tell everyone what that means and what that means for you? You know, I think that in the worlds of kink and fetish uh, mm -hmm. and sort of different sexual interests, preferences, orientations, whatever you want to call them, the terminology is so hotly debated and unclear and undefined. No one really uses the terms the same way. So something that I believe strongly is that my sexuality is a sexual orientation, which is to say it's innate, unchosen, and lifelong. Uh, I've been a spanking fetishist for as long as I can remember, and I never chose it. It wasn't a result of trauma or anything like that. It's always just been a fixed part of my identity. I've started playing around with the term alter sexual just because I think it uh, helps people understand that I have an alternate sexual identity, that there is an alternate practice in my life, that's spanking, that occupies the same place that sex occupies in the lives of most people. I've never masturbated to the thought of sex. I've never fantasized about sex. I don't crave sex. When I watch pornography, I'm not watching people have sex. Uh, spanking occupies the place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of most people, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize by playing around with the term alter sexual. But like I said, uh, we don't really have the words yet to discuss the, these parts of our identities. Okay, did you did you create the word alter sexual? I did, and it's caught on in a few circles among people who, like me, feel that their paraphilia, to use the correct clinical term, is a sexual orientation. But I want to be clear that not everyone thinks a kink or a paraphilia or a fetish is a sexual orientation. Some people are sex-oriented and enjoy incorporating um, different kinks or fetishes into their sex play, and that's fine, too. Um, when I talk about my paraphilia as an orientation, I'm only talking about my experience and uh, not attempting to describe anyone else's experience. We're all different. Which is nice. It really is nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, one of your... Okay, because you are into spankings and identify as a spanking. What is there a... Just spanking open hand, or what do you consider a spanking? So uh, this is something that's often discussed in the spanko community, that is to say people who are oriented towards spanking. Um, we've talked about how spanking is the core kink. It's really the, um, the beating heart of this identity we have. But other words that would be appropriate to describe our interest would be corporal punishment or even discipline. A lot of spankos, myself included, respond to things like mouth soaping and corner time and other kinds of sort of disciplinary um, acts of physical punishment. So while spanking is the core kink, it's certainly not the only part of our identity. Okay, so but I think mainly what I meant, like, is it spanking open hand you consider spanking, or would a paddling also be considered a spanking to you, or is it strictly hand? No, it's not strictly hand. Um, I, I have paddles, belts. Um, switches, birches, uh, hairbrushes are a very big one, um, wooden spoons, um, pretty much anything that could pop up in a sort of domestic or educational corporal punishment scene. 
Okay. Now, do you have a favorite? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I I think the answer to that question is the same as the uh, my answer to the question, what is my least favorite? Um, and I think it would have to be, in both cases, hairbrushes. I have a very strong love-hate relationship with them. I respond to hairbrush spankings very strongly, but um, as everyone who does impact play with wooden implements knows, uh, hairbrush spankings can be quite brutal. So um, I... I love hairbrush spankings, but I also fear them a lot. I, I, I think everyone can identify with that. I'm sure you know the feeling. Yes. Okay. Now, okay, spanking is sometimes, um, it, it is for pleasure and it is for punishment at times. Now, does that ever get confusing in your mind? Because I've always found that if you do one thing for pleasure, for myself, it should be implemented a different a different object or a different punish something different for punishment because I just it gets to the point where I can't distinguish well is he having a good time or is he having fun even if I'm being told. So in my case, um, I haven't personally had any trouble with those lines crossing, mm -hmm. um, but I can see how other people would. It is kind of an unusual thing to use the same practice for pleasure and for punishment. Um, in my case, I respond very differently to different implements. Um, a hand spanking for me is quite romantic and uh, pleasurable and even pleasant, um, whereas a more disciplinary hairbrush spanking or paddling, um, it, it certainly doesn't feel like pleasure. It, it is very satisfying in a visceral way, but um, I wouldn't call it pleasant. Um, so in my case, I, I usually don't have trouble getting those lines crossed. Okay, we also have a question from a listener. Does being watched or watching spankings appeal to you? Very much. <laughs> Very much so. Um, I have some amazing and beloved friends in the spanking fetish community. And um, I sometimes I get to watch them play. Sometimes we have parties. And um, I absolutely love uh, watching them be satisfied in the same way that that satisfies me um, and sharing those experiences together I think reinforces and strengthens our friendships um, so I have I, lo I love watching spankings for sure okay <laughs> okay and we also I my other question is um, we have you know other spanking enthusiasts and some that are just getting started in their fetish or they, you know, they may have had the desire to be spanked all their life, but you know, didn't feel it was okay. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I would say we've all been there. Everyone in the spanking fetish community, even people who don't consider it um, a lifelong and ingrained part of their identity, even people who just want to explore uh, different kinks and different interests, we've all been in a place where we were really nervous, where we felt... Um, ashamed or scared. We didn't know how to get involved in the communities or how to find someone to satisfy our interests. So I would say that listening to shows like this one uh, is a great way to get started. Um, it's a great way to hear different perspectives about this thing we do. Um, also, the internet is a really wonderful place to meet other kinksters, um, as long as we do it, of course, in a um, safe and responsible way. Um, you have to be careful about personal information and move slowly as you get to know people on the Internet because just like in vanilla life, you don't necessarily know who you can trust online. Um, but the Internet is a, is a great way to meet people, and it's, it's, uh, it's where I've met many of the closest friends in my fetish life. Um, and I guess, you know, I know that it's really scary, but if people ever feel up to it, I do encourage... Um, going to a party at some point. Um, I remember the first time I went to a spanking party, I was absolutely terrified. Um, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but it turned out to be one of the most rewarding decisions I've ever made. Um, so I don't want to pressure anyone. Everyone has to move at their own pace. Um, and if something seems too intimidating to handle, it's okay to wait until you're more comfortable. Um, but down the line, I do encourage people who might be interested to consider going to a party. You never know. You might make some of the best friends of your life. Agreed. 
So now that you're you're discussing party, which just works in perfect with my next question, I was going mm-hmm. to ask you: Do you have any uh, special events? You know, sometimes they have big um, big events like you know the King Fest and everything, but they have them just for spanking. Do you have any mm-hmm. any that you would su- suggest or recommend? Yeah, um, there are a number of big uh, spanking parties in the United States. Um, one of the biggest one is, ones is called Shadow Lane. Um, anyone who has spent enough time Googling spanking online has probably come across Shadow Lane. They're super famous. Um, but Shadow, the Shadow Lane party is held in Las Vegas um, every fall. I believe it's over Labor Day. Um, I'd also recommend... Uh, my personal favorite party, which is the Texas All-State Spanking Party. Um, it's run by a good friend of mine um, and spanking model, Princess Kelly May. Um, and it's every summer, I think it's usually in June, in the Dallas area. And I think that party is just a really fun, warm, welcoming, and safe environment um, where spankos can come and meet each other, play, um, and start to explore the community. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And when Yes, I, I highly recommend it. When is the Texas one? It's usually in June, but I know that um if anyone Googles TASP, Texas All State Spanking Party, T A S S P, um maybe with the word spanking, um th- there should be more information online. Okay, wonderful. Now you've also written articles and a book yeah. about spanking. I have, yeah. You want to tell us about your book or your articles first? <laughs> um, I would love to tell people about my book. It's, as I said, it's called Sex with Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Uh, it came out a few years ago from Harper Collins, so it's available on Amazon and any place that uh, books are sold. Um, it's basically a story of how my lifelong uh, love of Shakespeare helped me come to terms with my lifelong innate and unchosen um, obsession with spanking. For as long as I can remember, I've been obsessed with spanking. Um, I've been fixated on spanking. As I said, it occupied the place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of most people. Um, But I grew up feeling enormous shame and fear about this because I knew that this was a little different. I knew that when my friends wanted to watch a sexy scene in a TV show or Dawson's Creek or in a movie, um, I was not interested in those scenes. I was interested in the paddling scene from Dead Poets Society. I knew that I was responding to that scene in a way that uh, most people didn't. So I felt a lot of shame and fear. But um, as I said, my love of Shakespeare and my many years working with Shakespearean literature helped me um, come to terms with, uh, with my identity Um, The book goes in a lot of different directions. It touches on some very serious subjects. Um, For instance, I do talk in quite detail about the fact that I was spanked as a child. And uh, I talk quite graphically about what it's like to have what was to me a sexual act inflicted on me non-consensually as a child. uh, And how I think that the way we as a country um, form our laws around how we treat children's bodies need to change moving forward. So um, I hope people will consider giving my book a read. I worked really hard on it, and um, if anyone does read it, I would I would love to hear. I'm always grateful for feedback from readers. Okay, well, I'm, I'm absolutely getting a copy of it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'd be honored. Okay. So, okay, with this, okay, not, not all of us, mainly me, probably everyone else has read a lot of Shakespeare's, but I've seen, like, the movies that I can, you know, comprehend because the language is very... Um, out well it's outdated well at least for me <clears throat> so it's hard yeah. to, it's hard to follow so what was it in the Shakespeare his his writings that you identified with well there is so much every single uh, chapter of my book is a different Shakespeare play um, and there's so much to discuss in all the different plays mm-hmm. but um, to give you uh, one quote from Shakespeare that I think you might like it might not sound so outdated to you. Um, I'll quote one character from A Midsummer Night's Dream who's chasing after her boyfriend. Um, she's trying to win him back because he, he thinks he's got a crush on another girl. Um, so she's chasing him, trying to win him back. And he says, leave me alone. I keep telling you to leave me alone. Why won't you go away? 
And she says, And even for that do I love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave unworthy as I am to follow you. What worser place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? So um, I think that everyone uh, in your listening audience will understand why I responded to that line from Shakespeare so strongly and so emotionally when I first discovered it as a teenager. Um, I saw myself reflected in those words, and that was just the beginning of a, um, a love affair with Shakespeare that continues to this day. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out here. It's, it's all off topic. But here in Oregon, we do have a Shakespeare. Shakespeare In fest- Ashland. Yes. I've been many times. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm still waiting to go. I <laughs> have to leave the city. <laughs> so, In fact, one of, the, um, one of the most exciting days of my life was the day that someone uh, sent me a photograph of my book, Um, available for sale at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival bookstore because um, it was a dream come true. Oh my gosh, how exciting. I can just imagine. It was so exciting. Yes, okay, so I'm going back to me. Now, you also do kink writing not in your book. I do, yeah. I've done a number of articles for various newspapers and magazines about different aspects of kink fetishism and the politics that um, intersect with our world. Where can we find these? So all of my articles are available on my website, which, as I said, is www.jillianyc.com. That's J-I-L-L-I-A-N-N-Y-C.com. Um, but I've written articles about... Um, about sadism and masochism being listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, I've written articles about the legality of firing someone for having a kink or having a fetish Mm -hmm. um, because this is not a protected group in the United States. So if an employer finds out that um, we attend kink parties or are involved in a BDSM lifestyle, it is in most cases legal to fire an employee for that reason. So I've done an article about that. Um, I wrote one article uh, trying to explain why my fetish is not a preference or a hobby or an experimental phase, but rather is a sexual orientation. Um, and so much more. It's it's all on my website. And like I said, I'd be honored if people would take a look. Well, I'm sure you're, people are hitting it right now in bookmarking. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, I was under the impression that... Um, Sadism and masochism and the whole BDSM fetish things was taken out of the psychiatric yeah, so disorders. I, I would love to talk about that. In the most recent DSM, which was the DSM-5, sadism and masochism were downgraded to um, basically what they've in years past called ego dystonic um, manifestations of the uh, interest. So I'll explain. Um, For a long time, sadism and masochism were listed as mental illnesses, full stop. No questions asked. The only thing that happened in the most recent DSM, the only thing that happened in the DSM-5, is they said that sadism and masochism are not mental illnesses unless they cause distress to the person who is a sadist or a masochist. This is exactly the same thing that the DSM did decades ago with homosexuality. For a long time, homosexuality was listed as a mental illness, full stop. But then in the 70s, when your politics started to push back against listing homosexuality as a mental illness, the DSM introduced what they called, quote, ego dystonic homosexuality. They said that homosexuality was no longer a mental illness unless the person who was a homosexual um, felt distress about it. So it's just the same path in both cases. They say that a sexual identity is a mental illness, and then when they get pushback, they say, okay, wait, it's only a mental illness if you feel stressed out about it. But my response is, no, of course, you know, of course, gay men and lesbian women and bisexuals um, in the 1970s, of course, they felt some distress 
uh, about their same sex attraction. But that's not because they had a mental illness. It's because they lived in a culture that was sending them the message that something was wrong with them. So of course they felt some anxiety. It's the same today with sadists and masochists. If we feel stress about our interests, it's not because we have a mental illness. It's because we live in a culture where uh, pop cultural things like Fifty Shades of Grey send the message that there's something wrong with these interests, that it's a result of trauma or that it is broken in some way. Um, so I would like to see sadism and masochism removed uh, entirely from the DSM. But things are getting better. You know, the world moves slowly. <laughs> okay, well, now let's switch it. How do you feel, too, because being a sadist, being a masochist, or engaging in any of the kinks that we engage in, we are, not by everyone, but by, you know, the large mainstream of America or the, you know, the world, we are looked at as sexual deviants. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the impression I've gotten as well. How do you feel about that? I mean, I would say that I think the word deviant itself mm -hmm. is irrelevant um, as long as things are um, consensual and between adults um, and as long as the consenting adults um, are aware of the risks and, and take them um, eagerly and uh, wholeheartedly, then I don't think there's anything that, that qualifies as deviance. Um, the only thing that matters to me is that uh, everything is consensual. Um, and so as far as I'm concerned, there is consensual sexual behavior and there is criminal sexual behavior uh, that is non-consensual behavior. And um, deviance just doesn't exist. Well, I would agree with you on that too because also I find that most people in our community, we are not pushing our beliefs on other people. If they want to ask us about it, they can. If we bring it up and they tell us it makes them uncomfortable, we back away. We're not forcing anything on anyone. And Absolutely, I agree. Absolutely. We're just living our lives the way it, that is best for us. Yes, um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. I, I do too. Now, I was, I was really excited. Is that, Do you have more you would like to elaborate on, on your spankings or any information I missed? Because it's not a particular uh, fetish of mine. Uh, no, but the questions you asked were fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving me um, a chance to encourage your listeners to come um, to spanking parties in the United States mm -hmm. if they're interested in that. Thank you for giving me the chance mm -hmm. to plug my book. Um, and I will say this. Um, I would love to hear from any of your listeners who want to reach out to me, who want to chat. And if anyone ever sees me walking around a spanking party and wants to come say hello, please do. I'm always excited to meet other kinksters. Well, I'm not letting you off the hook yet because I still have a couple more questions. <laughs> That's great. Let's keep going. Okay. Well, I, I was really excited because, you you know, when I, I just read your FET page, like we discussed, because I didn't want to get other people's thoughts in my heads and everything. Not that they would stick around long, but I, <laughs> I really loved hearing about um, when you're not writing on fetishism, you have written this one article was um, particularly interesting. You writ wrote on a school for husbands in Niger. That's right. Um, in addition to being a spanking writer <laughs> and a Shakespeare writer, I'm also a journalist and a foreign correspondent. I'm chatting to you right now from Johannesburg, South Africa, actually, where I'm reporting. Um, and yes, as as you noted, I um, I did I have reported a number of times from Niger, and at one point I um, went to a United Nations funded uh, what they called School for Husbands in rural Niger where they were working with uh, leaders in the community to help men um, learn positive and um, effective ways to uh, communicate with their wives and um, sort of interact with their families in uh, sort of harmonious and um, positive ways. So um, that was just one of the many wonderful experiences I've had uh, as a journalist. Yeah, I just, when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> How fun! It sounds almost kinky, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. But then you also mentioned you had, um, and I've, I've got to ask about these because even though they're off topic, they're very exciting. You reported from a pirate prison in Somalia. 
I did, yes. Um, as I'm sure your listeners already know, um, over the past few uh, decades, um, piracy off the coast of Somalia has been a problem. A number of international um, takers have been kidnapped by pirates. Maybe some of your listeners saw um, the film about this issue starring uh, Tom Hanks a couple of years ago. Um, so I was um, very fortunate to spend some time working in Somalia and uh, reported on the 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 problems with um, arresting and prosecuting pirates in the country. Um, without going into too much detail, if anyone wants to read the article, it is on my website. Um, one of the major problems facing the international community when it comes to, um, to prosecuting pirates and discouraging piracy is that a number of the or people who are arrested and charged with piracy are extremely young and, um, like many Somalis, don't have birth certificates. So it's impossible for the international community to determine their ages. So moving forward, it's hard for the criminal justice system to uh, know whether to try these pirates as adults, to try them as children. Um, and that's only the beginning of what is a very tricky and complicated process. So um, that's one of the, in my opinion, one of the best articles I've ever done. Um, so thank you for asking about it. Oh, well, I'm going to ask about the, the other one you... Um, the Nuclear test site in Pakistan. Yeah, so um, Kazakhstan is, was part of the former Soviet Union, but because it's quite a um, remote part of Central Asia, there's a place in Kazakhstan called Semipolitinsk where the um, Soviet Union tested a number of its nuclear um, weapons, its nuclear bombs. And... Um, Despite the fact that this nuclear testing happened in many cases decades ago, um, the nuclear fallout and the sort of chemical residue of those tests lingers today and has um, caused environmental problems and health problems for people who live in the area. So um, I traveled to Kazakhstan with the International Reporting Project and um, was very honored to learn about um, some of the ways that people in uh, that part of Kazakhstan are uh, both suffering from the the nuclear history of the Soviet Union, but also um, recovering from it and transforming the land in um, beautiful and, and fascinating ways. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, okay, with your your reporting seems to be a little on the dangerous side. <laughs> Do you also well, have a little kink there for living on the edge, danger? You know, I don't think I have a um, sexual response mm -hmm. to danger in my work. Um, I do everything possible to keep myself safe when I'm reporting abroad, um, and I don't solicit danger or choose stories just because I think they will be dangerous. Um, I pursue stories that I think will be interesting and important. Uh, but I will say this. I do sort of live and have for years with a kind of constant fear, a constant worry that someday the two halves of my career, the serious journalist side and the spanking writer side, might conflict. Um, every time I pitch a new article to something like Foreign Policy Magazine or um, the New York Times, I'm kind of scared that an editor will say, who are you to write about uh, the nuclear history of uh, the former Soviet Union? You're a uh, Pervert, you're a sexual deviant, as you said. <laughs> um, and I, I will admit that um, being as open as I am about my spanking fetish, um, both personally and professionally, has caused some problems for me. Um, I'm not going to lie. There is, there are misunderstandings out there. There is some um, suspicion um, and even some judgment um, of of people who talk about this kind of sexual lifestyle. Um, but that being said, um, I think overwhelmingly the two halves of my career have not conflicted, and I've been really delighted to see that for the most part people um, are enlightened enough and awesome enough to say, okay, sure, you wrote a book about spanking, but you also wrote an article about pirate prisons in Somalia, so clearly you can do both, and we're not going to um, exclude you from one of your interests just because you write about another of your interests. So, um, it's, so far, it's been a really positive experience. And that's like, well, I can see you're clearly doing a good job on both. 
Now, do you think it would have been worse if you were hiding the fact that, you know, you tried to put a different pen name on your Shakespeare book and you try to hide that fact that you are a spanky and that's part of your life and then someone finds out? Don't you think that would have a huger backlash on you? You know, I think that, um, you know, because I, I, of course, mm -hmm. kept this a secret for a very long time uh, mm -hmm. because for many years, like a lot of us, I think, I felt a lot of shame and fear. But in hindsight, I realized that by keeping this a secret, the only person I was hurting was myself. And that when I admitted who I am and who I've always been, I opened um, myself up to some really phenomenal friendships um, and relationships that otherwise wouldn't have been accessible to me. So, well, I can't say for sure whether um, it would have been better to keep uh, my fetish a secret mm -hmm. from a professional perspective. Mm -hmm. I can say that from a personal perspective, outing myself uh, as I did, um, and I outed myself first in the New York Times, so I really came out with a bang, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was one of the best decisions I've ever made. So I'm guessing your family knows. Yes. And they're okay with it? No, uh, I would say some members of my family have been extremely supportive. Um, one member of my family tried to sue HarperCollins to stop my book from being published. So it's been a mixed bag for sure. Oh, is that even possible to sue to have a book stopped from being published? That just seems... Like it's, it's possible to try, but I'm delighted to say that that attempt was um, resoundingly unsuccessful. <laughs> it just seems like an unwinnable case to silence you know, someone like that. That was my impression too, but you know, people can people can try anything, I guess, if they are willing to spend the money. <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. that just kills me. I mean, it's just. It's but I'm shocking. delighted to say that it that that attempt failed, and my book is available. So. Yeah, I'm sure. We, I'm. I'm like I said. I'm going to get it. It sounds. I've got to. Since you gave your reading of Shakespeare and how it affected you, I'm definitely going to get the book and read further on it. Well, you've made my day, so thank you. Oh, you made mine too. Now, is there anything else? Because I I tried to keep this short and put the interview in the top because you are in. South Africa and it's late for you and you <laughs> probably need rest but I don't want to leave anything else out that you think may be important to say and I definitely want to make sure you get all your plugs in for your book your writings your sites and everything like that you know it is late in South Africa mm -hmm. but there's nothing I like more than talking about spanking I could stay up and talk about spanking all night long so <laughs> Well, then we want to hear all about it. You're the one, the what you think is the most important aspect of it. What you think? Um, one of my questions. Okay, I've got to squirrel off here now in mid sentences. I've had the wet hand spanking. Have you had that? So I've had. I've been spanked with implements mm -hmm. that were uh, soaked in water which in some cases makes them heavier or stingier. Uh, I know if you, if you soak a, a wooden cane in water, um, it's got a bite that really is unlike anything else. Um, but I don't think I have heard of a wet hand spanking before. Will you tell me about it? Well, it's well. I'm not even sure it's wet hand. A bit like my old man, sir, he would rub my butt down with the water, and then I guess mm -hmm. it was wet hand, and have his hand wet, and you just whack it, and it gives the sting you were talking about, and it's... It's it's really unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> it, yes, I know the feeling. So it's it's just a wet spanking. I don't know how else to describe describe it, but it's so pain. It's so much more than a hand whacking you. It's it's that sting. It's funny how something as seemingly harmless as water could make a spanking hurt even more, but it can. Well, everyone knows how powerful water is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Water can kill us uh, and keep us alive. So I guess I shouldn't underestimate water. Yeah. It's so okay. I'll go back. So is there is there more? I mean, more you want to tell us about spanking the the importance of it? That any anything else? Um, I guess the only thing that I would add, and I think this is a good way to 
to wrap up our, mm -hmm. our chat, um, is that spanking is a healthy and natural um, point on the spectrum of human sexuality. And um, whether it's something you are just experimenting with for the first time or you're curious to explore or whether it's something you've been obsessed with ever since you were a tiny toddler, um, that's great and awesome. And there's a community that's ready to welcome you and there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and I would love to uh, say hi if we're at, a, at the same party at the same time. That's wonderful. Okay, so now plug your book again in your Twitter, in FET, and your website. That's very important. My book is called Sex with Shakespeare, um, not and or on or to or anywhere a mouse could go. <laughs> Sex with Shakespeare. It's on Amazon.com. Um, it's in Barnes & Noble or anywhere books are sold. Um, my website is JillianNYC.com, and I'm on Twitter at Jillian Keenan. I'm on FET. Um, my name there is also Jillian Keenan. Um, I'm pretty easy to find on Google. So um, if anyone wants to reach out, my email address is on my website. Um, I'm accessible on FET. You know, I'm a, I'm a friendly person. Come say hi. Oh, very friendly. I, I want to thank you so, <laughs> so much for coming on. I, I can't thank you enough, and I know it's been very hard with all your travel and work you're doing right now. No, it was a thrill. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay, so I'm going to go to a song, and I'll be back. And that was Julian, the spanky writer. <laughs> Lecture. <laughs> and then we go. Oh, if I can get those. Okay, there you go.